Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you today in this very early morning in Mostar in Bosnia-Herzegovina. I'm lucky to be accompanied by um, Edina Becerevic from the University of Sarajevo and Lana Perlic, a member of the federal parliament of the leading opposition party, the SDP, which yes. is a multi-ethnic social democratic party. So welcome. My name is Kari Uslan. I work at the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. We are sitting here in front of the symbolic old bridge built in the 16th century, destroyed in 1993 during the Balkan Wars and rebuilt in 2004. But I wonder today, 27 years after the war ended in Bosnia, has the bridges between the people in Mostar and in Bosnia been restored? I'm wondering if you, Edina, maybe would like to start, um, help us understand how the war affects the situation today for the Bosnian people. Uh, well, it has been three decades since the beginning of the war. It started in 1992 and it lasted until 1995. Um, Many analysts in the West, particularly, present that war as the civil war, as something that was without control, that spiraled out of the control. But there was nothing uncontrollable about that war. Uh, it was a planned aggression from Serbia and Croatia with the plan to divide Bosnia and Herzegovina and to appropriate parts of the country. Um, but the targets were also civilians and in particular Bosniak, Bosnian Muslim civilians. Um, they were target of um, mass extermination, crimes against humanity, and that process, which started in 1992, culminated in genocide in Srebrenica in 1995. However, the target was also multicultural Bosnia, and citizens of all ethnicities have been the victims of this war. Because the idea of Serbia and Croatia um, was to destroy the multicultural, multinational social structure of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, now, we can say that despite the political narratives and political plans that are very much still the same as, as, as they were in 1992, though now they're trying to achieve those plans by political means. So despite uh, those plans, life goes on. People communicate, life has normalized. Um, market doesn't really like um, ethnic boundaries and people do communicate despite political, um, divisive political narratives. So yes, I would say that the bridges between the people of different ethnicities in Bosnia um, have been restored uh, despite those negative political circumstances. Okay, thank you. It sounds like there is some hope. Uh, Lana, I want to bring you in here um, because Mostar used to be known for its tolerance and mixed marriages, but it is still divided with Bosniaks living predominantly on the one side and Croats on the other side. But you grew up here in, in Mostar and I wanted to, to ask you, you were born during the war, but how did this division affect your childhood? Uh, actually, I don't think that uh, Mostar is a divided city. I think that's perception of uh, political narrative and the media narrative that, mm. that is bringing uh, Mostar in the center of attention all the time. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, uh, Mostar was before the war one of the, uh, the most multicultural cities 
in former Yugoslavia together with uh, Travnik, concretely in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Mm. And it's interesting that today those two cities, Mostar and Travnik, are like the main target for um, uh, policy of division, of dividing, of discrimination, mm. uh, especially in educational uh, system. I was born during the war here, in, in, not here in Mossad, but, but uh, in, in Makarska, but when we came back here, actually I was born and raised uh, in, in, in Mossad on both sides of the Mossad. And mm. I will uh, use uh, the phrase of one of the students from the high school, uh, it, it was podcast something like this, when he said that there are two kinds of people living in Mostar. And first one is that those people living in Mostar are just on one coast of Neretva, and there is another type of people living in Mostar who are living on both coasts uh, of Neretva. And I'm one of them who mm -hmm. is living on both co co coasts of, of Neretva. And I found that as my heritage and my obligation to, 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 to know the city, to respect its culture and its uh, history. And by raising me, my grandparents and my mother mostly, uh, didn't force me to choose anything, but to uh, be familiar with everything. And I don't find that I'm living uh, next to someone, but I'm living with someone. And that someone is not uh, targeted with their nationality or religion, but by the only division between good and bad people. And I think that should be a narrative for the future as well, because as Bosnia and Herzegovina, we are all uh, one to, to, be, to become part of the European Union. And we are talking all the time about EU PAT and uh, those values. And actually, we here in Mosar do have those values, but we have to dig in again and find them again. I wanted to, to follow up a bit on that because uh, we talked a little bit yesterday and you told me that you um, you took part in this system of two schools under one roof. Mm -hmm. And could you please explain for us who never experienced this, um, how that was and, and um, how that worked? Because it is still in, in, in the system, a part of the system, isn't yes, it? Yes, it yeah. is part of the educational system. and. When you, when, you, when you Google it and when you enter uh, two schools under one roof, it will be, uh, research will show you schools in Travnik and in Mostar, but actually we have 54 uh, that kind of schools in, in Federation Bosnia Herzegovina, mostly in so-called mixed cantons. And there are three cantons in Federation like that, where we have system two schools under one roof, which is, in my opinion, uh, nothing less than discrimination of the, of the children. And that's the system where uh, students of, of Bosniaks and Croats are divided in, in, in school. But the biggest irony, for, for instance, in Mostar is that we have Gymnasium Mostar, uh, which is two schools under one roof. And on the roof, uh, on, on, on the very um, top floor, you have United World College, where kids from all over the world come uh, to come together to sit and to exchange their cultures, experience, uh, to broad their views, but kids from the same city are actually divided just based on the nationality. Hmm. But that's not the worst case, actually the worst case scenario here that we are living for the 20 and something years is that uh, children who goes uh, uh, on creation plan and program and curriculum. For instance, I was in that uh, curriculum. You do not, as a, as, as a child who, 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 who goes to the creation curriculum, you do not learn a lot about Bosnia and Herzegovina, mm. but a lot more about Croatia because the books are from Zagreb. Mm. So basically you don't learn about, I don't know, a famous poet from Mostar and you are living in Mostar and you're going to school in Mostar. So I think that you're making those kids uh, intellectually much um, weaker than others. So all uh, will for you to broad your views um, is actually put on very individual level. Hmm. So in fact, the school system contributes to cementing the ethnic differences. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. From the very young age. So. And, and at school, were there are no um, meeting places for the two ethnic groups? 
Yes, there is meeting place. There are meeting places. For instance, in the gymnasium, uh, we, we were not in divided shifts, but we were just divided by the classrooms. So uh, every second classroom is, is for one curriculum. So we went to the same shift, but they were like physically in other classrooms. But while at the other side, you have uh, that model of two schools under one roof in Travnik, where they are actually physically uh, divided, they have two, two entrances. So, um, as you previously said at the very beginning, uh, Mostar was before the war, uh, the, 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 the city with the most, the, the, the biggest percentage of so-called mixed marriages in former Yugoslavia as well as Travnik. And so you can see today that, uh, let's say, revenge on that, because those cities are divided in, in the school systems mostly. Mm -hmm. So now you have identity crisis of, of those, those children going to, the, to those schools, especially children who was born uh, during the war, during the 90s. Yeah. Okay, so I want to build a bit on that and, and move it back to where what you said earlier, Edina. Would you say that, um, that the ideologies from the war and extremist IDs are still lingering among the people? And, and if so, what type of radicalism do you have in today's Bosnia? Could you please unpack this? Because it is a bit complicated. Yeah, it does sound a bit complicated for the uh, outsiders. Uh, but for us, it's actually very easy to understand once, once you're inside. Um, the problem in Bosnia is that it's uh, difficult to define what's radical and extreme in terms of, let's say, fringe radical extremist groups. Because in order to say that something is extreme, one needs to know what is moderate. And the problem in Bosnia and Herzegovina at the moment is that um, mainstream ethnic political parties, uh, they actually maintain radical political narratives and they want to perpetuate those wartime narratives and wartime divisions in order to actually stay in power. And what Lana was mentioning and, and, and elaborating about the uh, school divided school system, what she was elaborating, it's actually what the uh, present uh, ethnic political elites want to do. They want to um, educate divided generations, those that would um, live in believing in, in, in their ethnic exclusivity over the other ethnicities. So that is a problem. So on the one hand, we have uh, radical political narratives and radical political parties, but then uh, um, international researchers often focus on, um, let's say, Salafi, radical groups and they overlook uh, radical uh, groups associated with um, Orthodox Christianity or with Catholicism. But what we actually have is the cocktail of those um, radical political groups that function in some sort of reciprocal radicalization concept by kind of feeding uh, each other radicalization. But that's what the and, 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 and it's, it's not the mainstream population. The mainstream population, unlike the mainstream political parties, is actually um, um, quite distant and moderate. Uh, and, and the mainstream population does actually see through that manipulation of political parties and, and marginalized uh, groups um, are those that, are, that fall for radical uh, and extremist narratives, are those that are vulnerable, socially disenfranchised, economically disenfranchised, uh, people with uh, psychological problems and so on. But the problem with international researchers is often that they 
look at those marginal groups um, and and by over focusing on those marginal extremist groups, they present Bosnia as the um, kind of hotspot uh, of, of, of extremism, which it is not, because people, um, uh, ordinary Bosnians, they reject those uh, extremist narratives. They're very much pro-Western oriented. And as Lana mentioned, we all want to see Bosnia as the member of the EU and the member of NATO. In the end, when they decide to leave, uh, those that are disillusioned and then they decide to leave, they opt for going to the West right. and uh, n not going to Russia or Saudi Arabia. Yeah, exactly. And this resonates very well with what we have seen in in other parts of the world through our the research that we do together, that, of course, most people are not radicalized, although people have very many good reasons to be angry. So so it is an important reminder and also to contextualize uh, the issue of radicalization is important because it differs a lot, even from village to village. Yeah. So, but um, Lana, just to follow up a little bit on this, because just a few days ago, around 700 engraved stones and roses at this partisan memorial cemetery in Mostar, which is one of the, the largest anti-fascist monuments in the Balkans, have been destroyed. I was wondering whether you wanted to comment on that or whether you have any, you know, whether you could share any interpretation of that uh, in view of what Adina just said. Yeah, so a few days ago, actually, we got that terrifying news because uh, that kind of destruction didn't happen even during the war. No. And now people are really angry on that because that's just not the symbol of anti-fascism and uh, all those values, but that's also cu cultural heritage. Hmm. of this city, and not just this city, but also of Bosnia and Herzegovina, because that's national monument of Bosnia and Herzegovina of the first category. Hmm. So it's basically now those uh, gravestones are destroyed. And um, it feels like anger as well as insecurity of the people. And again, in the media, unfortunately, hmm. uh, my town of Mostar is, is presented as being uh, uh, city of fascism, of vandalism, and so on and so on. And I cannot accept that because mm -hmm. that's only few people who did that. And that's not uh, the real representation of the city we are sitting at today. As well as uh, Dina said, those examples of people uh, that uh, someone is researching, they are not representing the majority of the people. Mm -hmm. So every 14th of February, we will go. We would go to to the to the partisan uh, cemetery, and and th there is like always ten or fifteen or twenty them who would uh, say bad words on us of, of people who 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 came there. But there is also a lot more people who came uh, there to 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 to, uh, to celebrate uh, that day. And for me, it's really frustrating because uh, because of that image. In the in the in the in the public mm. of Mostar is seen as 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 that kind of city, and I cannot accept that fact, you know. And I also feel sorry for for uh, my citizens who feel insecure because of the act of of some of the, of few people. But the thing is that that feel of um, being insecure by those events is actually the product of not doing anything about it mm -hmm. in previous years. So this is not the first accident, but is one of the great, uh, the largest accidents. So in the last 20, 30 years, we do have those um, uh, acts of vandalism every uh, then and now, but we do not have anyone who is responsible for doing that. Mm -hmm. So no one points finger on someone and say, oh, you are responsible by your na name or surname. You did it because you want it or someone told you to do that. Mm. So we didn't, uh, the, 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 the whole mechanism of the, of the system didn't uh, recognize 
and accused anyone publicly on that. Mm. So, and all that happened and will be forgotten, people will forget in three days and then again something will happen. Mm. So, you know, it's a little bit frustrating. So I want to, to move to you, Adina, again, and, and maybe um, look at, you know, in, the, on, in Bosnia as such, there seems to be um, two types of crisis, a political crisis and a, a latent security crisis, which is also influenced or, or there are consequences for, from the ongoing war in Ukraine, in the Balkans mm -hmm. and in Bosnia. So I was wondering whether you would like to, to say something around this. I mean, either the political crisis and or the, the kind of latent security crisis. Well, we, we, we've had, a, in a way, I can say perpetual latent security crisis over the past at least um, 10 years uh, when um, Republika Srpska uh, leadership uh, has actually started very much publicly advocating with support of Serbia as well as Russia secession of the majority Serb part of the country. So that's the latent security crisis. But what happened in um, December um, 2021 um, was a major security crisis. It's when actually um, uh, leadership of Republika Srpska um, threatened to um, secede, very openly started uh, proceeding to establish a separate army, separate judiciary, separate police. And we all know that this kind of um, uh, secession would not be able to be implemented uh, and, and carried on without the war. So, I mean, analysts and some political centers in the West that were warning about the renewal of the war in Bosnia at that time were not alarmist at all. And then Ukraine happened. It was probably postponed, uh, delayed, and, and according to some public statements by the Russian ambassador uh, to uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, to Sergei Lavrov, foreign, foreign, foreign minister, and even by some Putin statements and Milora Dodik statements, it's obvious that they have not given up on um, making Bosnia their sphere of influence. And they openly said in, in on couple of occasions, if Bosnia decides uh, to continue on, 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 on the path of joining NATO and the EU, they were threatening with Ukrainian scenario. Um, frankly speaking, I think that the Russia is weak now. I don't think they have a capacity to start uh, the new war. But there is also a threat uh, of um, Milora Dodik, the leading secessionist leader, um, either, you know, for, for threat from his perspective to either losing the election, in which case he will probably end up in prison because corruption charges uh, against him uh, do, do, do stand. Um, so, and, and those kind of authoritarian, autocratic leaders, when threatened by the loss of power, they can actually uh, start unrest or, or, or some war. Or there is a threat of uh, Russia deciding that they need the new um, hotspot and they need the new to, to make new trouble for, 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 for the NATO and for the West. So um, I, I wouldn't be able to actually uh, predict as we were not able to predict uh, the such a large scale invasion 
in Ukraine, but I'm encouraged that uh, the NATO and some uh, main Western centers are aware of the danger and that they're ready to send more troops uh, to Bosnia. And I think that they have quite decisively said uh, no to Russia uh, and 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 they, they show that they will defend Bosnia and Herzegovina in case Russia, through its proxies, actually tries to start the war in Bosnia. Now, well, that's interesting. Um, <clears throat> I would like now to perhaps move a bit away from from the war and, and the current um, problems and challenges, so to speak, and uh, looking a bit ahead and, and um, looking at possibilities for building bridges and uh, reconciliation. So um, I wanted to ask both of you um, how to restore uh, the bridges between the people and, and perhaps uh, challenge you if you have some examples of uh, ways in which um, bridges have been restored or cities that have been very divided where there have been some kind of initiatives which uh, one can build on. I don't know, uh, do you want to start, yeah, um, first, Lana? I think that we need just to accept the fact what happened in the history. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that politicians should say what happened in the history, but the courts and uh, analysts and historicals they will make those books and they will make uh, the, 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 the writings about what happened and our children will learn about it. Mm. Uh, we can deny some uh, things that happened, but they happened and they will uh, forever be written in some books or in Google or mm. whatever. Mm. So we cannot deny that because in October this year we will have elections. Mm. And people who were born, kids who were born in 2004, they will have right to, to vote today. And we are still talking about uh, either the Second World War or the um, war that happened in, in, in the 90s. Mm. So we, can, we are stuck in those, those frames of the time and we cannot think about future because of that. Mm all the time when they ask me as someone who is young and in politics, oh, can you comment something on what happened in the 90s? I do not have credibility to talk about it because there are people who were here, who witnessed all of that and they have credibility to talk about it. I do not have credibility. I have responsibility to accept the facts, you know, and not to give my opinion about it. So the facts are not questionable. Hmm. And I think that we need some more Billy Brandt uh, examples in, in this in this country, mm. you know, to, to, to stand up for for for, for some uh, things and to say, okay, this is a fact and this is a true and that's not questionable anymore, mm. you know. So, and I think that's that's first step to move forward, and also to have maybe some new generation of the politicians, because now the average age. Uh, of politicians is about 70 years old. And those people from international community also who, who come all the time to Bosnia, the people from international community do change, but the politicians here are all always the same. Mm. And they are about 70 years old and they do not care what will happen in 20 years mm. because maybe probably they won't be alive uh, in, in that point of time. But also that's our also mistake of the people living here, that we are choosing those people, uh, same people uh, for 20 or 30 years. So international community do not have uh, any choice but to speak to them. Hmm. So that's that's responsibility of all, our, of all of us. And actually that's, uh, in democracy there are good and bad sides. Good sides is that you can choose and be chosen. But the bad side is that responsibility that we are not used on. Yeah, now interesting, turning to you, <laughs> Edina. But we talked yesterday a little bit about um, examples where bridges have been built. 
could you please share um, some yes, of that with us? Um, I, I can. I, I, I think uh, the example of floods uh, in 2014, we were hit by really severe uh, floods in, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but uh, majority Serb entity was um, affected more than, um, than the Federation. And it was amazing. And I remember international observers being shocked by the civic solidarity of people by being shocked that Bosniaks and Croats rushed to help Serbs um, in, in, in their local uh, municipalities, both institutionally on the level of municipalities, but there were also there was also a, a, a number, massive um, help by um, uh, citizens themselves going on their own uh, initiative to bring food, to save endangered uh, Bosnian Serbs and so on. And we, that was a great momentum that shows um, that solidarity among people exists and that as this, the word reconciliation, we don't need, but it is actually taking place. Um, it's only sad that um, dominant uh, um, uh, ethnic elites don't want to use those momentum to institutionalize um, the multi-ethnic nature of the Bosnian society. So that's, that's actually sad, but I think there is hope that we do have new generations um, of um, politicians uh, um, and they have a great chance. Uh, and and um, they have a great chance because people are very much aware Citizens of Bosnia are very much aware that uh, uh, present ethnic elites are corrupt, that their ideas are retrograde, uh, that all they can do is drag this country eventually, sometimes in the future, maybe even in the renewed conflict, or keep it permanently in this you know, institutionally frozen conflict, uh, as, 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 as they call it. Um, but they have to, the generation of new politicians has to rise above ethnic politics uh, and they have to show that they are morally above present ethnic politicians. But I'm hopeful. I think that if we do get the secure NATO, the secured framework through um, NATO membership that I, I, I hope we will get before uh, the EU membership, that uh, reforms and the restoration of multi-ethnic Bosnia is possible. That's um, a positive note and we will wrap up. I was wondering, Lana, if you want to, to share some of your thoughts and, and hopes for, for the future. Uh, well, I don't have anything much to add, but to say that the security is first and what Edina finished with, I uh, will finish with that as well. Being part of the NATO and being part of EU is something that should be um, our goal, but not just in uh, election campaigns, but in our everyday uh, work. So we have to, we have good examples and I'm really happy that we finished with the example that, that uh, Adina said with the floods. We have that examples on every day, basically. On every day, uh, basically, in, in, for instance, in Mostar, we, as I said, we do uh, have lives and we didn't give up on that. So I, I don't think that we should be pessimistic, of course, because of that pessimism. A lot of people do leave uh, this uh, country, but they're not leaving because uh, they they feel uh, less value because, because the, the, they're not leaving just because of jobs, but because of that uh, 
feeling of being stranger in their own country. Mm. And that is thanks uh, to the system which we have. And I think that system can be changed and the people habits should be changed. That's the easiest uh, to change. And we saw that in the past, so we can just copy that. I don't think that we should be uh, extra smart uh, to, 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 to make some steps, but we need to have uh, some will. But we will see uh, what people will say on the elections about who they want them to represent in the future. It's good to, to end on, on this um, more hopeful uh, note. Um, thank you so much, Lana and Edina, for sharing your insights, thoughts and reflections with us. It has been very, very interesting. I wish you the best of luck um, and thank you so much. Thank you. Kari, thank you.